can't go away from God. He's everywhere. And he gave us instructions how we're to win people to Jesus and to baptize them and even how to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that you allowed another one to be born into your family by faith in Jesus Christ. Comes this morning to, de to declare unto the world that he has received Jesus in his life and by the authority of this church is now following that first order is to be baptized. Thank you for this day. Bless Brother God as he leads us and directs us and he performs this baptismal service. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you all out today, and once again, we're privileged to be able to be in the baptismal waters of the day. We bring Calvin to be baptized. Calvin, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Yes. Have you asked him to forgive your sins and to come into your heart? Yes. Calvin, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do that every Sunday. It'd be great, wouldn't it? Then when we sing this song, when we all get to heaven, there'd be a whole lot more of us to sing. So if you would, please turn to page 514. When we all get to heaven, page 514, please. <coughs> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway clouds will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sign when we all get to heaven what a day Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let's all stand. How many of you got a smile in spite of the heat? Got a smile somewhere? Put it on your face. Turn around there and share it with somebody and ask them, Are you going to heaven? I want to meet you there while we sing those last two verses, please. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll see and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. We all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll see and shout the victory. Won't it be a great time when we get there? When we all get to see Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's going to be a terrific time. Praise the Lord. Calvin, God bless him this morning and his family. We just thank God for them. We pray that God will just bless your hearts here today. Would you bow with us? 
and a word of prayer, please, this morning. Brother Ed, would you lead us as we pray, please, sir? Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Oh, it's so good to see you all out today. It's an excellent day to begin a worship service with a baptism. And we've done that quite frequently in the past few months. And we're going to do that again on the 24th. Angel will be baptized on the 24th. And we have one other candidate for baptism at that time. I hope that he's here. And we'll be able to take care of that. I want to thank the Whitaker family for the flowers that are in the front of the church and we appreciate that and then I also want to read a card from them it says to each and every one at Trinity thanks so much for all the prayers cards calls that we received during Janet's sickness you are all special and very appreciated we thank you and love you all very much thanks for the wonderful meal after the funeral and the effort that was put forth thank you very much Jerry we we just felt an honor to be able to to serve that meal and to be able to help at that uh, time. And those of you who come, I want to thank you for that and thank you for your efforts there. I want to welcome you this morning. I know it's, uh, I've been kind of busy already this morning, but it's a great day. Anytime you see a young man who's given his heart to Christ and sitting out in this world and telling the world that he's ready to show the world he's a Christian, it's a wonderful day. We appreciate that. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, I hope that you've been made to feel welcome. I hope that you're made to feel a part of our service our regular attenders, it's always nice to see you here. Uh, I want to thank my Sunday school class. Angel give me, handed me this this morning. It says, love, love your neighbors yourself, Matthew 22, 39. And on this, if you, you probably can't see it, I may stick this on the bulletin board, but our neighbors are all different people. It's not just uh, those that look like us and those that act like us and talk like us. Neighbors are all the way around, so we need to be kind to all of them. Our regular services here at church, we have a Sunday night service, which is a preaching service, much like it is during this morning service. That's at 6 o'clock. On Wednesday night, we do Bible study. And right now, we're studying eternal security of the believer. Are we saved forever once we accept Christ? And then on Sunday school, we have at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, you'll learn about the Bible if you come. Sunday school is one of the most important things a new Christian can do is to be in Sunday school class. Our upcoming events today, Force Creek Common today at 2.30, Deacon's Meeting at 5 this evening, Golden 60s is Tuesday. Now, this is for anybody who wants to come help. I made the mistake in saying it was an age limit and got called out on it. There's no age limit. If you're 10 years old and you want to come and help, that'll be wonderful. I'm going to try and have all five of my grandkids here. There's my sister. I didn't see you. Uh, I was trying to have all five of my grandkids here on Tuesday, and hopefully they will be, and if, if they will, they'll be the younger ones here. But come join it. The older folks like to see the younger kids and enjoy the time together. Come out and be a part of that. Then Wednesday night we'll have Bible study and a business meeting. You'll notice back on the back bulletin board behind the sound stage is a note con uh, talking about our food pantry that we're helping to sponsor, Share and Care. This past week they had eight families that they helped and that's a part of our church and if you want to contribute to that you can do so monetarily or you can do so with food or um, toiletry items anything that you use on a normal basis they can use so please if you want to bring stuff in we'll take it down and make sure it's taken there I want to read off a list of prayer concerns this morning and ask that you pray for them as you go through the day uh, the Whitaker family and their loss the Hamilton family and their loss Mrs. Butler is home not doing real well but on the mend uh, Rex Giz Gibbs is at home and says he's doing real well uh, Shelly Bell is Mrs. Butler's sister-in-law and they called the family in yesterday and told them it's just a matter of time for that uh, Wayne Reynolds is he's recovering he's been in the hospital for a few days but seems to be doing much better and then Michael Truax needs our prayers uh, John Brown will be having surgery on Wednesday uh, I will keep everybody posted on what's going on and try to keep you updated on that. Uh, Eunice B. had surgery this last week, and I found out this morning she had to go back into the hospital last night, so we want to remember her. Marlena Spears is uh, home with uh, second-degree burns to her arm, 
and Jesse Gully will be undergoing some uh, physical therapy. We want to be praying for her. And then Karen Lakes is not doing well, and we want to remember her in our prayers. Our trivia question this week is, what were the four rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden? God bless as we worship together. Turn with us, please, to page 135. Nothing but the blood. Page 135, please. <clears throat> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part and this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Our offertory hymn this morning is page 469. It says, Revive Us Again. You've missed a Sunday school lesson. You missed a good one this morning. We found out that Paul had to go back and revive some of those people that got kind of messed up on some things this morning in Galatia. And praise the Lord, sometimes as Christians we need to revive ourselves. We kind of get laid back sometime on a sunny afternoon and we kind of, you know, get at ease with things. And we need to be revved up for the Lord. So let's turn to page 469 for offertory hymn, please. <clears throat> For the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee. Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Our glory and praise to the Slain, who hath borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Would you stand for the last 
verse, please. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Praise the Lord. Would you bow with us in a word of prayer, please? Brother Alan Carter, would you bless the offering for us, please, sir? Amen. over the hilltop one of these days if we're going to occupy that song says for free it was paid for by the blood of jesus christ praise the lord shelly told me she has a song she wants to sing for us this morning and i think it's one she has written i believe I'm not sure but she just it's not one you written okay i'm sorry she just doesn't have the music she's just going to sing an acapella usually that's the kind she did it's called How Can I Help You Say Goodbye, and it's by one of my favorite singers. And it's basically about even though it's hard for us to say goodbye, we have to remember that when we do say goodbye to people, they are going with God. Through the back window of 59 wagon, I watched my best friend Janie slipping further away. I kept on waving till I couldn't see her. Through my tears I asked again why we couldn't stay. Mama whispered softly, time will ease your pain. Life's about change, nothing ever stays the same. She said, how can I help you say goodbye? It's okay to hurt and it's okay to cry. Come let me hold you and I will try. She said, how can I help you say goodbye? I sit on our bed, he packs his suitcase through my I held a picture of our wedding day. His hands were trembling, we both were crying. He kissed me gently, 
Then he quickly walked away. I called up mama. She said, Time will ease your pain. Life's about change. Nothing ever stays the same. She said, How can I help you to say goodbye? It's okay to hurt and it's okay to cry. Come, let me hold you and I will try. She said, How can I help you say goodbye? Sitting with Mama alone in her bedroom, she opens her eyes and squeezes my hand. She said, "I have to go now. My time here is over." Through her final words, she tried to help me understand. She said, "How can I help you to say goodbye? It's okay to hurt, and it's okay to cry. Come, let me hold you, and I will try. How can I help you say goodbye?" I'm glad we have the Holy Spirit to do that for us today. You know that? He's the one that can do that for us. You know, I had this song picked out. Shelly said she was going to sing. You know, sometimes you need to mind the Spirit. We talked about in Sunday school class this morning about being led by the law or being led by the Spirit. And you know what? We need to let God be our guide. How many of you here know somebody that's lost? Okay, this is song is for all of us because I do too. It simply says, you know, that you're the only Jesus that some people are ever going to see. The way you live your life for Christ is going to make a difference. Whether people meet you, whether they talk with you, but they're going to watch you and they're going to see you. And it doesn't mean just our family, it's our neighbors, the people at the grocery store, whoever you come in contact with. If you're a business person, who you talk with, there's going to be people that are lost. And you might be the only Jesus they ever see because they might not ever come to church. There's a world of people in America that have never darkened the doors of a church. And you might be the only Jesus that they'll ever see. You just listen to the words of this song. <coughs> If not in you, I wonder where Will they ever see the one who really cares? If not from you, how will they find? There's one who heals the broken heart Give sight to the blind. Cause you're the only Jesus some will ever see. And you're the only words of life some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. <clears throat> and if not you, I wonder who will show them love and love alone can make things new. There's one who 
betray their hopelessness for joy in return. You're the only Jesus some will ever see, and you're the only words of life some will ever read. So let them see in you one in who. I'd like for you to take your Bibles, if you would, again this morning and turn to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be looking at the third chapter, the last part of that chapter today. <clears throat> it's on page 390 in your little black pew Bible. Nehemiah chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 28 to 32 today. I forgot to mention the drive that we have going on for pure water pure love but my container is about a third full now and I hope you're working on yours saving your change and dropping it into the bottle to bring it in when you get it full go ahead and bring it in get another one try to fill it up uh, you can do as Marina did take it to work and uh, bum around and get it all full you'll be happy to happy to have that but uh, remember that as you go along this summer it's a great project and um, it'll be good for go their children's church. If your young ones want to go over to children's church today, uh, you can go back in the back now and they'll take you on over to children's church. Rochelle will be back there to pick you up. We've been looking over the past few weeks at the building of the walls and the setting of the gates of Jerusalem and, and all that goes on there and the, and the way that it's taken care of. And we've seen uh, from looking at the text that it takes an effort and it takes a planning to do it. It takes uh, concentration and consecration to do it. And we've seen the, the growth and we've seen the, the walls starting to come up and the gates starting to be set. And we've looked at the meaning of some of those gates and how they apply to us today. I think it's important as we uh, go through the Old Testament in particular that we find ways that apply to us. A lot of times we look at it strictly as history or we look at it as stories that are told and we really don't find the significance for us today, but it is a very significant book for us. And it tells us a lot about what we should be doing in our lives. And today I want us to finish up this, the gates, and we're going to do the last three, and there are ten total, so we've already done seven. We'll do the three today, but we'll see how they apply to us and how they are to encourage us to build our Christian lives. It's important that we understand as Christians that we have an obligation to build the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is just simply the rule of God in people's hearts. And if we're going to do that, then we've got to get them to the point where they can accept Christ and accept Christ into their lives. Then they will know what it is to have the kingdom of God to rule in their heart. We began our study the very first 
gate that we looked at was the sheep gate. And the sheep gate was the gate that they brought the sacrifices into the city and that's there where the priests would take them and they would take them then to the temple or to the uh, tabernacle, whichever the case might have been, but here the temple, and they would offer them a sacrifice for the people. We're also going to end up today with the sheep gate. It takes us right back to the very beginning. And the wall as it gets completed, it finishes out the wall. It begins with sacrifice and it ends with sacrifice. And that's what our message will do today. Take, if you would, your Bibles, read Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 28 through 32. And again, I will apologize for the names that I mispronounce. They won't mind. They're not around, so they won't mind at all. Beginning in verse 28 and going through the remainder of the chapter, it says, From above the horse gate repaired priest, everyone against his house. And after them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer, over against his house. After him repaired Shemaiah, the son of Shechemiah, the keeper of the east gate. After him repaired Haniah, the son of Shalomiah, and Hanum, the sixth son of Zapheth, another another piece. After him repaired Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. After him repaired Malachi, and the goldsmith and sons, unto the place of Nethiams, and the merchants over against the gate of Mikvah, unto the coming of the corner. Between the going up out of the corner and the, unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for today, and we thank you for the blessings that we've had this week, and we thank you for your care and your watch over us. We thank you for the way that you have protected us and the way you've given strength. We mention again the prayer request that we mentioned this morning, and we pray that you might touch each one of those, that you would work with each one individually. And I pray right now for Brother John that as he is worried about what's going to happen, concerned about his life. We pray that you might just reach your hands down to him, that you would give him strength, that you would give him patience, that you would give him understanding, and that you would guide the doctors as they do the surgery on Wednesday, that they might be able to do what they need to do to get things corrected for him. This morning we come to you asking you to bless our hearts, to open our minds, to regenerate us as Christians, to give us a new drive to serve you, that we might truly be able to see the kingdom of God come here on this earth as it is in heaven. Bless this morning. Take my words and make them to be the words that you would have us to hear. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds. Allow us to be receptive to the words that are in the text. Allow us to understand how it applies to us as individuals. Give us the strength that we need, and we'll give you the honor and glory for all that happens. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we're looking at the last three gates, we see that it talks about the horse gate in verse 28. This gate is a gate that today may not be as necessary as it once was, but the horse gate is the gate where that the horses came into the city. Now, you would think, well, that's transportation. No, in, in the day that this was written, horses were not used for common transportation. They were used for war items. And they were part of the war, and they were not just there for every day. I know... Jim Duvall and some of the rest of you, Miss Ruby, like to ride horses, and they're enjoyable. And when you get into that thing, if you, once you learn how to ride them, they're very enjoyable, very nice to do. But this, at this time, it was not really for pleasure. It was for the military side. And the reason it comes out and the reason that it comes to us today is that the, the horse gate tells us that we're in a battle. And we are. There are constant battles going on in our lives. Each one of us face those battles. We don't fight against the physical outside, although that happens sometimes. Most of the times, <clears throat> most of the times our battles are against spiritual things, the things that war on the inside of us. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in the high places. So we as Christians fight battles, but it's not the ones that we can see. It's not the ones that we can lay our hands on. It's the battles that are within, the, within us. And the closer we get to God and the closer we become to what God wants us to be, the harder Satan is going to battle us. He wants to defeat us so that we cannot be effective in our witness. 
It's important that we put on the whole armor of God. And we see that in the book of Ephesians where it talks about putting on that armor so that we can maintain the battle, so that we can go through and fight the wars. It's important that we establish ourselves and know how we can defeat the enemy at hand. We must walk worthy of the calling too. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 it says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. All of us have a calling. Now, my, my calling is a little different than some of yours, and some of yours will be different than mine, but all of us have one calling that's in common. And that calling is to spread the gospel. Brother Bob read this morning, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, 18, 19 and 20, telling us that we should go out and to spread the word of God, that we should tell the world about Christ. We as Christians, when we accept Christ into our lives and ask Christ to come be our Savior, ask Christ to come be our Lord, we are given a command to go. And there we have a vocation. Our vocation, our responsibility, our job is to tell others about Christ so that they too might accept Christ, so that they too can be a part of the kingdom of God. We're not going to fight that battle outside physically. We're going to fight it spiritually. And when we defeat Satan, then we can tell others about Christ. We're called to be good soldiers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, it says this, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not only are we just to tell others about Christ, but we're actually to be soldiers, regimented, very, very frank and very forward with what we're doing, thought out, and have a game plan laid. When we battle today as a country, when we battle, we battle with a lot of different armors. And sometimes it doesn't even take a person to go to the ground. They have what they call a drone airplane, and that drone airplane will fly over, and they use a little control like you would on a game console, fly it over, locate the position, and shoot the rocket at it. God's not chosen to do that. God's chosen for us to fight the battles. God's chosen us for, for us to be the soldiers, us to be the warriors. And if we're going to accept the responsibility that Christ has given us, if we're going to accept the job that God has given us, then we need to become good soldiers. We need to fight to accept that. The next gate I want us to look at is in the 29th verse. At the end of that verse, it says the keeper of the east gate. Of course, the east gate would be on the east side of the city. It would be logical. But what's the purpose of the gate? All the gates that we've had thus far, all of them have a distinct purpose. And the east, east gate is not an exception. The purpose of the east gate was, for, was from there that they would see the morning sun coming up. And as they saw the horizon begin to light, then they would be able to look out and to see if there were any enemy around. It's difficult for us to understand that this city would be closed up during the night. The gates would all be shut. There would be no in and out except through small portals. There was no way that people could get into the city and fight with the city. But there also were people on the inside who would want to get out. First thing in the morning, they would be standing at the gate waiting. And the keeper would be out looking across the horizon, looking to the east to see if the sun were coming up. When the glimmer of the sun began to come up, then he would start surveying the land and looking to see if he could see any enemy hiding or any enemy prepared to take action against the city. When he saw all things were cleared and he saw... ...to come. It was an order that said, open the gates and people could come and go as they wished. What's our application for us today? look to on a physical sense there's no way that we have to understand the way it is what we have to understand today is how does this apply to us spiritually well you know the Bible teaches us that Christ is going to come from the east in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27 it says this for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west shall also the coming of the Son of Man be and what we as Christians need to do, we need to be looking toward the east, looking for the glimmer of light that's coming. We know that Christ is going to come in that eastern sky. 
He's going to come for us, for we who are alive and those who are dead ahead of us will also go. But Christ is coming for his church, and he wants to rapture his church out. He wants to take his church out of this world. And we need to be looking toward the east. Have you ever been out on the ocean, on the Atlantic Ocean, and look as the sun's beginning to come up and watch it just decrest at the top of the ocean? It looks like the ocean goes on and on forever, and its sun just seems to rise right out of it. Well, that's what we need to be looking for spiritually. We need to be looking for Christ to come. And as we are looking for him to come, then we can see the glimmer of hope that he has to offer us. He's going to come from the east, but he's also going to come unexpectedly. It's not something, it's not something that will happen just all of a sudden you'll think, wow, wonder if Christ is going to come today. That's not really what it's about, but what it's about is that we have to be ready all the time. Uh, understanding of what's going on. He's not going to give us a heads up. You know, a lot of times when I traveled, coming back from Kentucky, when I lived down there to come home, I would always give mom a heads up or give my family a heads up. I'm coming home. I'm coming home and they'd be ready. But Christ has already given us the heads up. He's told us, I'm coming back. I'm coming back at a time that you don't expect. I'm coming back when you won't be watching for me. I'm coming back to set the captives free to bring them back home with me. And that's what we as a church have got to be looking for. There's a glimmer of light on the eastern horizon. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know any season at all. It was supposed to have happened last month, I believe, or the month before last, according to a pastor out in California. And then he got his figures wrong, and now then it's happening next year sometime. I don't know. I know the Bible says we don't know the hour, but the Bible says to be looking, to watch, to wait. And this eastern gate tells us that we should watch and wait too. The glimmer is there. Hold your fingers in Nehemiah, if you would, please, and turn back to the book of, of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's on page 874 in a small pew Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We see that the Bible tells us here that we should be watching. We should be waiting that Christ is coming. And when he does, he'll take his church back with, us, with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, going down through the end of that chapter, it says this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. As we think about Christ and as we think about his coming, we have to understand that he's coming back for us individually. He's not going to send his angels. He's not going to send a messenger. He himself is going to come back. It is going to be he who comes to that eastern sky, opened up with the trumpet sounding, and we'll see him. But we must also be ready. The Bible tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first. In the 16th verse, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then the 17th verse, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. As Paul was writing this text, he believed Christ was coming back. He believed that he was going to come back in his lifetime. Because he talks about those who are dead. He talks about those who have gone on before him. He talks about the dead in Christ. But he also says, we, we who are alive. This was written over 1950 years ago, 1970 years. But what we know is that he was expecting that coming. And because he was expecting it, we should be expecting it. The Bible tells us to look. We know not the hour, know not the time, but we need to be ready. There were others who, turn back if you would to the book of Nehemiah, there were others who worked on the gate also. It wasn't just uh, the gates themselves, but they did work also other places. If you would look at Nehemiah, the third chapter and the 30th verse. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 30, it says this. After him repaired Haniah, Haniah the son of Shalomiah, and Hanum, the sixth son of Zalphoth, another piece. After him repaired 
Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. Now it's given people all throughout this reading of the chapter, other people who helped. But this one it talks about over against his own chamber. Sometimes we get the idea that missions is somewhere else. And we'll give our money to missions. We're giving money here to a mission. A mission to help provide water for those who are, are without water. To help provide an opportunity for missionaries to serve. And that's what this money's going to do. And we think because we do that, we've accomplished our task. Sometimes we even want to go on mission trips. And I know this church has been on a couple of mission trips and different times have done different things for missions. Some of them been done here in the States, some of them out of the States, but always doing mission trips. But we see here in this passage, the last part of this verse, it says, and after him repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. Where was his work done? His work was done right at his own place. Where can we start our work? Where can we begin our work of building the kingdom of God? We can begin right at our own homes. We can find out who our neighbors are, who our acquaintances around about us are, and start telling them about Christ, inviting them to church, building that relationship with them. Each one of us know of different people who are lost that we can share our faith with. Brother Donnie asked us that question this morning. Do you know a lost person? All of us should know many lost people because we ought to be working on them to get them to come be a part of our fellowship, to get them come and accept Christ into their lives. But what we have to understand, the building of this wall wasn't always about going someplace else and working. It wasn't always about helping out around the big gates that were there. It was also taking care of what needed to be taken care of in their own area. And we as Christians need to do that. We as a church need to be taking care of things in our own area. We need to be helping those who are around about here to accept Christ. It's been a glorious couple of months or so, and we've had baptism after baptism after baptism, and what a wonderful time it is. But you know, just as many of we baptized, there are that many more out there who need Christ. We need to be out sharing that gospel. The last gate, the tenth gate, is the gate of Mithgad. Look, if you would, please, in verse 31. Over against the gate of Mithgath and to the going up of the corner. Finished it all the way out. This is where it ends. Mithgath gate is one that you can't tell what it is from just the word. The reason being it was not translated. It was transliterated so that it would be part of it. But the word Mithgath in the Hebrew means to review or register. This gate was the gate where that they would register as they come into the city. Now, they didn't have visas like we have today. I, I, I don't have one, but I, I may get one sometime because I'd like to maybe take another cruise. You've got to have a visa. You've got to have a way to get in and out of the country. They didn't have that, but what they did have, they had a gate where all the visitors would go and be signed in. They kept track of who was coming and who wasn't coming, who was going in and out. So that was a gate of registry, but it was also a gate of review. It would be the gate where David would have sat and watched as his troops came back from war. It would be the gate where Solomon watched as the troops came back from war. It was here that they would march the parades. We can remember in the 60s and the 70s how they would do in Berlin and how they would do in Moscow. They would parade their troops before the leaders. They would parade in the armor. They would parade in the men. They would parade in everything they had and they would bring it for review past the rulers. Well, in this particular gate... They it. They brought it out for review. They would come in and see what was going on. But how does that apply to us today? I don't think that we have to be reviewed. I don't stand at the back door and watch everybody who comes in and give you a nod, yes or no, you can come in. I don't think that any of you do that at your homes either. You don't have people review and come by. Now I know some of you, when you were raised, you might have had parents who actually looked at you and said, okay, you can go out. No, you can't go out. Go back in and do this again. My mother used to do that. Would look at behind your ears, under your chin, on your neck, open your mouth to make sure you brush your teeth. She'd check you out. Okay, you can go. But that's not what we're talking about. But you know, there's going to be a review one of these days for us. A review of what we've done with our lives, what we've done with what Christ has given us. It will be a review that will help us to understand what's going on. 
We must be prepared for that. If you hold your fingers in Nehemiah, we want to go to Second Chronicles, or Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians, chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It's on page 855 in the smaller pew Bible. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. I believe it gives us an understanding of what the misfit gate is for us. There is going to be a review. There's going to be a time that we're going to, to give accounts. There's going to be a time that we will pass by and be expected. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive things done in his body according to that that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's going to come a review, and we're going to receive a reward. We're going to see, receive a just reward for what we've done. We're going to file by the judgment seat of Christ. And as we go by that judgment seat, Christ is going to hand out the rewards, it says here, that everyone may be received, the bottom part of the 10th verse, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There are going to be the rewards handed out. Now, this is not a judgment to see if you're going to heaven. This is not a judgment to see if your Christianity is going to stand. It's a judgment to see what's happened in your life after you become a Christian. Too many times we think that becoming a Christian is the ultimate goal. That's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to be like Christ. The ultimate goal is to act as if, as if we are Christians, to go out and to tell the world about Christ. That's our ultimate goal. But one thing we have to remember is that one day we're going to give an account. One day we'll file before that. The 10th verse again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It says we must all appear before the judgment seat. Not so that we can be condemned. That judgment is the great white throne of judgment that's talked about in the book of Revelation chapter 21. But this is the review. This is the looking over. The passing in front of the troops. And it's there that we'll get our rewards. It's there that we'll give an account. Turn on back if you would to James James chapter 2. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. It's on page 892 in the Smaller Pew Bible. Page 892 in the Smaller Pew Bible, James chapter 2, and then beginning in verse 14. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Going down through verse 18, it says this. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say, I, he have faith, and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the, to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I believe very firmly the Bible teaches, and I can show you time and time and time again, that we do absolutely nothing to earn our salvation. Our salvation comes to us as a free gift of God. It comes to us without obligation. It comes to us because he loves us so much that he gives us that gift. But yet at the same time, when God gives us that gift, we as Christians have on the inside of us a change that comes about that points us in a different direction. I often see Christians who accept Christ and who have come out of lives that have been kind of rough and you see them starting to work and build their lives to a different direction. There's a change that occurs. Certainly faith is important. Certainly we have got to have faith. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that it is not the works that saves us. It says, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's going on here? What's it saying here? 
It's saying, what happens if you see a person who's naked and destitute? Well, if you see a person who's naked, I hope you would take off your coat or your jacket or something, give them to it to cover it up. But that's not really what it's talking about. It's talking about those who have the basic needs of life not met. What do we do when we run across those? Do we just pat them on the back and say, God bless you, go on, he'll take care of you? Or do we meet the needs? The reason for having the pantry in Greenwood, the reason for helping that Greenwood is to help meet the needs of people in our community. To help meet part of those physical needs. So we read here in the 16th verse, and it says, One of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the, the body, what doth it profit? How is it profitable? How did it help them at all? But the question then comes to us. If we have the faith to be saved, if we allow God to give us that salvation, if we take that free gift and we never, ever work, what does it profit us? How are we blessed? The 18th verse sums it up when it says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show you my faith by my works. We as Christians should be different than the world. We should have a life that shines. We should have a giving life. Tuesday, we will see our faith in works. We will see how that we come to this church to have a service for those in rest homes, for those who are in convalescent centers, to come into our place and to have a worship service, to have a meal together, We'll see our faith at work. We see our faith at work when we're out knocking on doors, talking to people about Christ. We see our faith at work when we stop in the grocery store and witness to somebody. We see our faith at work when we reach up on the top shelf and grab something and hand it down to the person who needs it. We see our faith at work when we pick up that person who's walking and take them to their destination. The Bible asks us to be people of works, to show our faith, to know, let others know that our faith is there. Knowing this, knowing that we are going to have to give an accountability, knowing that we should show our faith, knowing that our faith should be demonstrated by our works, we should be fearful and serve God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11 says this, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men because we understand what God is saying, because we understand the direction we need to go. We ought to be persuading men. We ought to be persuading people to come, be a part of the service of God. Come to be part of us. That day that we pass before the judgment seat of Christ, there certainly are going to be some great names recognized and some great names rewarded. I think Billy Graham will be one of those. He'll get great rewards. But you know, there's also going to be a lot of people that day who pass by that no one knows their name who are going to get huge rewards. Huge rewards for what they've done. A lot of times in a church, we get to see who's prominent and out front, and people will associate me with the church and associate what I do with the church. But you know, it's the people who are behind the scenes that make the church go. It's many of those who are going to have the reward. It's that person who's brought their neighbor, who brought maybe a friend to church, and that friend brought a friend, and all of a sudden you have six or eight or ten people who have accepted Christ because of one effort that we've made. There are going to be a lot who never, ever have had their name called when they come before that judgment seat are going to be rewarded greatly. You might be one of those here this morning you might be one who will receive the reward. The Bible, back in Nehemiah, the Bible tells us that they come back to the corner. In the 32nd verse, chapter 3 of Nehemiah, it says this, And between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. The wall's complete. They started at the sheep gate, all the way around, all the gates are put in and back to the sheep gate again. 
the walls complete. The Sheep Gate, I'll simply say this, that it's a place of sacrifice. I won't go into the long description of it. But the thing I want us to see is that when we began this study, in the very first part of this third chapter, it talked about the Sheep Gate. That Sheep Gate, when we talked about it then, was talking about the sacrifice, the sacrifice that we have. We don't offer sheep anymore for sacrifice. No one does that I know of. But Jesus Christ came and paid the price for our sins. And it is that sacrifice that we need to think about. As we began with that sacrifice a month or so ago in our first look at this chapter, we come right back to the same place again. It begins with sacrifice and it ends with sacrifice. All the things that are in the middle may be important. All of them may have their own stay. But the most important is the beginning and the end. The most important is the sacrifice that Christ has made. When we look at this final gate, when we look at the sheep gate, we see that He has paid the price for us. We must always remember the cross is the start, the cross is the finish, and the battle is in between. One of these days, Christ is going to come for us. As I said earlier, I don't know when, I do know where. He'll split the eastern sky. Now, how is that possible, Brother Bill? The eastern sky to us is the western sky to somebody else. I understand all that. I don't know, but that's what the Bible says. He'll come in the east. He'll come quickly, and he'll come victoriously. We must be ready. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. What we have to understand is that on Christ, the day that he was crucified, all of our iniquity was laid on him. All of our sins were put there. All that cleanses us comes from that cross. Christ paid the price for us. The Bible says, Romans 5, 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You might be here this morning, you might be the worst sinner in the world. You might have more sin in your life than anyone else, but you know what? That sin has been paid for. The price has already been paid. The redemption has occurred. Just as it began with the sheep gate, and just as we saw that sacrifice, we come right back to it again. I ask the question, are you fighting for the kingdom? Are you working to see his kingdom grow? Are you looking for his return? Are you ready for the review of your life? Are you ready to walk in front of that judgment seat? Are you ready for Christ to look and to hand out the rewards? Perhaps you're here this morning, you say, I don't even know that I'm a Christian. I've never accepted Christ into my life. Today would be the day to do that. The price has been paid. The sacrifice has been offered. The redemption is ours. Will you accept it this morning? Christ may be speaking to you about something. Maybe talking to you, maybe even about joining our church or changing some things in your life, making a new direction for yourself. Whatever that decision that needs to be made, will you make it today as we stand, please? Father, we are thankful that you have paid the price. The price has been paid through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you receive that and that you accept that. We pray that you might bless us as individuals and help us to be more concerned about the kingdom building, to be more concerned.